Welcome to the June edition of the Conservation Outcomes webinar series. My name is Elizabeth Creech, and I am a Natural Resources Communication Specialist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service Resource Inventory and Assessment Division. It's great to be with, here with you today. We host this webinar series to highlight activities across the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, related to efforts to assess and quantify the impacts associated with NRCS conservation programs. These one-hour live webinars occur on the fourth Thursday of even-numbered months at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. We will get started with today's presentation in just a moment, but first, a few logistics. If you would like to receive email notifications with information on upcoming webinars, please subscribe to the NRCS Conservation Outcomes topic via GovDelivery. You may do so by following the instructions on the screen. A direct link to subscribe, titled Subscribe for Conservation Outcomes Webinar GovDelivery Email Update, is available under today's link. You may access those at the bottom left of your screen. As mentioned earlier, today's webinar is being recorded. All participants joining the webinar are in listen-only mode, and all audio is being broadcast through your device's speakers. If you are having problems with audio, sometimes computer or mobile device headsets can help with the audio quality and volume. It may also be helpful to log out and back into this webinar session. Please note that there is a closed captioning link provided in the Today's Links box. You may click this link to access live captioning. The captions will open in a new browser window where you can follow along with the presenter's comments. We will also provide a transcript after the live event along with the event recording. Please note that additional helpful links are available in the Today's Link box. The slides from today's presentation are available for download in PDF format under the Today's Handout section. If you would like to make the slide presentation pod larger, you may use the icon with the four corner arrows that appears in the upper right of the presentation box to turn on and off the full screen view. Finally, we encourage everyone to actively participate in today's webinar. Please type questions or comments into the Q&A box that you will shortly see appearing on your screen. You can submit your questions and comments throughout today's presentation. We will address as many of them as we can at the end of the event. With that, it's time to get started. I am pleased to turn the microphone over to Dan Malarkey. Dan is our NRCS Resource Assessment Branch Leader. Thank you, and over to you, Dan. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the latest installment of NRCS's Conservation Outcomes webinar series. NRCS has a long history of working with farmers and ranchers to help them conserve the natural heritage and sustainability of their operations. Uh, these recurring webinars give us a way to communicate to our stakeholders the importance of voluntary conservation programs and the funding provided through the Farm Bill, and to highlight some of the documented outcomes in terms of natural resources and sometimes in terms of economic benefits. For nearly 20 years, uh, our Conservation Effects Assessment Project, or SEEP, has been documenting outcomes for a variety of resource concerns. SEEP works closely with our science partners in other agencies and academia, and outcomes generated help inform improved conservation delivery across the agency. Today's webinar is another great illustration of how science-based assessments not only quantify wildlife response, in this case, we're talking about lesser prairie chickens, but also generate important insights as to how planners and producers can improve the land for this species and for others that also rely on intact rangelands uh, of the Great Plains. 
In, in working with landowners and producers, we rely on the best science coming from our university partners to provide the best assistance possible to our cooperators on the land. So today, we're excited to share a compilation of findings from uh, numerous studies led by our science partners at Kansas State University, focused on improving our understanding of how lesser prairie chickens respond to various land uses and management practices and how producers can help this at-risk species on productive working rangelands. So thank you again for joining us today. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Charlie Rewa, our SEEP Wildlife Component Leader, who will introduce today's presenter. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm Charlie Rewa. I'm the NRCS Wildlife Component Leader for the, for the uh, Conservation Effect Assessment Project. And, Thanks again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're excited to share some outcomes, findings, and science generated from many years of studies supported by SEEP and others aimed at improving our understanding of the habitat needs and, and management of the lesser prairie chicken, uh, an iconic prairie grouse of the southern high plains. We'll see how the science generated informs our work with ranchers and landowners in managing grassland habitats to benefit chickens and agriculture producers alike. Uh, the agenda for today's webinar, uh, first uh, I'll share a few words about SEEP Wildlife Component uh, and the new Great Plains Grassland Biome Framework for Conservation Action, uh, and then turn it over to Dr. David Hocus, uh, Associate Professor at Kansas State University and uh, the Kansas Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Uh, we should have some time at the end to address questions that come up during the presentation portion of the webinar. <coughs> so. Um, the Conservation Effects Assessment Project Wildlife Component. Well, well CEEP has several components. Today, we're just focused on the wildlife piece. And our objective with that is to document fish and wildlife outcomes from NRCS conservation work and to really to use those outcomes to inform more effective conservation delivery. And we work across the agency divisions and, and headquarters, our state offices, and others to identify priority assessments to work on. And as Dan mentioned, we rely on uh, cooperative partnerships with the wildlife science community, including universities, NGOs, and other state and, and other federal agencies. And so since 2005, the uh, SEEP Wildlife Component has been supporting outcome-based assessments through over 80 cooperative agreements with science partners. Uh, assessment findings, reports, and other documents can be found on the SEEP website included in today's link. So uh, the lesser prairie chicken population in occupied range has significantly declined since the 80s. Um, and greater than 99% of the current range occurs on private working land. And so in the past decade, uh, NRCS has been working with landowners and producers to improve lesser prairie chicken habitat on these private working lands. And science partnerships between NRCS and Kansas State University and others have been documenting outcomes of this work and, and developing the science needed to inform effective conservation delivery for the benefit of the lesser prairie chicken and the producers. So since 2016, um, Deep Wildlife has been working in partnership with Dr. Dave Hocus at Kansas State and other state and federal science partners to assess the habitat needs of this iconic species and, and to help us understand how our work can benefit it. And, and much of the science generated by Dr. Hocus and, and others uh, has been used to develop the recently released Working Lands for Wildlife Framework for Conservation Action in the Great, Place, in the Great Plains Biome. And so with this framework, while we recognize the conservation challenge presented by the historic decline of the lesser prairie chicken population, uh, through the Great Plains Framework, uh, NRCS and its partners have created a strategy for conserving the species while maintaining livelihoods on productive rangelands. A major theme of this strategy is wildlife conservation through sustainable ranching. Uh, and the framework lays out specific recommendations for using farm bill conservation programs to, to strategically focus on um, intact focal areas of working grasslands to address the major threats to the biome, which are woodland expansion and land use conversion. 
So by identifying core areas and taking action to defend and grow them, the framework provides hope and a pathway to effective conservation of prairie chickens and other species that rely on intact grasslands of the Great Plains. The science generated by Dr. Hocus and others informs the framework and our work with producers on sustainable grazing and other conservation practices. Uh, so now I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. David Hocus for the main webinar presentation. And I'll be back at the end of the webinar for the Q&A session. So uh, Dr. Hocus, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity today to spend a little time talking about uh, some of our research that we've been doing uh, through Kansas State University in conjunction with uh, USDA and many other partners. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Charlie uh, for helping to facilitate this research. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Christian Hagen, who is a major uh, factor in many of these projects uh, associated with uh, US, USDA and NRCS. Um, much of this work uh, could not have been done without the uh, extreme effort of about 15 uh, graduate students and postdocs, along with 75 or so field technicians working on 40 different pieces of property or uh, with 40 different private landowners throughout the species, uh, Lesser Prairie Chicken Range in Kansas and Colorado. What I'd like to do today is spend a little time talking, uh, giving a little context and background uh, relative to the ecology of lesser prairie chickens, and then go into some of these uh, practices that can be used to manage lesser prairie chicken habitat and some of the standards uh, that should be goals um, in terms of developing conservation strategies for this important bird. The lesser prairie chicken is uh, one of the iconic species of the southwestern Great Plains. Even though they occupy a relatively small area of the Great Plains, um, their range does include areas that are dominated by mid-grass prairie in the eastern part of the range, short grass prairie in the northwestern part of the range, and then in the western and southwestern part of the range, sand sagebrush and sand shinery oak prairies where they are associated with, with shrublands and, and grasslands. Uh, lesser prairie chickens need large prairie landscapes to persist. Uh, persist. Uh, the area or the size for a sustainable population is somewhat uncertain, but you will see numbers anywhere from 20, 30, up to 50,000 acres to sustain a population. Their occupied range is characterized by extreme environments and climate. Uh, they're frequently uh, um, experiencing or stressed by uh, intensive droughts, uh, extreme weather events, and wide temperature ranges. So they're uh, really hardy, uh, unique species in that they have a very wide range of tolerance for certain um, climatic and weather conditions. Throughout much of their occupied range, uh, grazing is the dominant land use. Uh, <clears throat> McDonald, um, Define the current occupied lesser prairie chicken range as four different ecosystems. Uh, two thirds of the current occupied lesser prairie chicken range uh, occurs in in Kansas, with in Kansas also supports about 90 90 percent or more of the current um, extent or current um, populations of lesser prairie chickens. These four uh, defined ecoregions has very have very unique landscapes and a range of threats with differing relative priorities of, of, of impact to lesser prairie chicken populations making conservation you know somewhat difficult to uh, generalize across the species range this these four ecosystems have been defined in the northern part of the range as the Shortgrass Prairie Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP mosaic, where you have shortgrass uh, prairies primarily dominated by you know, buffalo grass, blue grama, and other such species, intermixed with uh, CRP lands and some mid-grass, mid, and, and occasionally tall grass species. To the west of, and a little bit south of the uh, 
shortgrass prairie CRP mosaic ecosystem or ecoregion is a sand sagebrush prairie in eastern, southeastern uh, Colorado, southwestern Kansas, which up until the 1980s probably had the greatest abundance and density of lesser prairie chickens um, of any of these ecoregions. Then down in eastern New Mexico and, and western Texas in the San Shinri Oak Prairie, uh, you have a very isolated population of lesser prairie chickens that are dependent upon a very unique uh, landscape form that is very sandy, has dunes, and really, really harsh environmental conditions at times. And in the far eastern part, in the most music or most uh, area where it has the greatest amount of rainfall, lesser prairie chickens are found in the mixed grass prairie, uh, which is probably the largest ecoregion in terms of area, but um, has its density um, has been going down for quite some time in terms of the numbers of birds. Uh, <clears throat> contemporary populations of lesser prairie chickens peaked in the 1970s, 1980s, and have been declining since then. This uh, figure is based off of some estimated uh, population values uh, for the entire uh, range of the lesser prairie chicken. Um, however, since 2012, um, there have been a, an annual aerial uh, survey of lesser prairie chickens in all of the ecoregion. And you can see here that you know, there is some variation from year to year um, following the major drought uh, in 2011, 2012, throughout much of the lesser prairie chicken range, the population did increase um, overall, um, the total population. However, much of that increase was due to the shortgrass prairie TRP mosaic population, whereas the other populations in the other three ecoregions uh, remained uh, basically either stable or declining um, based off of this survey. Some hypotheses for these population declines. Um, one interesting thing to note is populations of lesser prairie chickens are well known to go boom or bust or have large fluctuations in this area of high uh, ex and extreme intense changes in weather and climate. However, um, during the last three or four decades, these populations have not bounced back during uh, <clears throat> good environmental years. And so some of the hypotheses for this is loss and fragmentation of lesser prairie chicken grasslands that have been converted to other uses, primarily croplands. Uh, anthropogenic structures, such things as roads, power lines, uh, wind turbines, towers, things of that nature um, have le lead to avoidance or increased mortality by lesser prairie chickens, have steadily increased across the range of the species, leading to functional habitat loss. Uh, the climate has started to change, um, including more uh, increased frequency and intensity of droughts and increase in temperature, both of which do not allow these periods of, of good to excellent environmental conditions, allowing the species to uh, regain populations and, and rebound in the previous occupied areas. And then other um, hypotheses include reduced food quality or nutrition issues, uh, there's some speculation regarding disease, hybridization, and predators. Um, of probably of greatest note is the uh, hypothesis related to reduced habitat quality, which relates to vegetation structure and composition, which is a, a theme throughout much of our work. Um, then there's a loss of heterogeneity uh, in vegetation in terms of composition and structure at both the landscape and patch or um, our other smaller scales. There's a loss of fire in the in eastern portion of the range, which has led to trees being invaded. And as you'll see later, trees uh, um, create a, a tremendous response uh, by lesser prairie chickens. And then um, unmanaged grazing throughout the species range, especially in the western semi-arid uh, area of this species. Um, is, has really uh, impacted and changed the habitat and the landscapes um, that um, have caused the lesser prairie chickens to avoid areas where they used to be uh, quite abundant. In uh, 20, 
21, the aerial survey basically estimated 30,000 uh, 500 prairie chickens, 90% of which are in the state of Kansas. Um, 25,000 of the estimated number currently uh, is estimated to occur in the shortgrass prairie CRP mosaic uh, ecoregion, and then small, much smaller estimates of population abundance in the other three ecoregions. This uh, relatively large proportion of the population in the shortgrass prairie CRP mosaic, this is, in my opinion, somewhat a precarious um, situation. Uh, this ecoregion currently supports about 83% of the estimated lesser prairie chicken population. This is a relatively recent population, um, you know, essentially undocumented until the late 1990s. Uh, this lesser prairie chickens in this ecoregion are highly dependent upon CRP um, to exist. And um, the landscape composition of this ecoregion is kind of sitting on a threshold of, of barely being viable to support lesser prairie chicken populations in terms of the amount of grassland in this area. And so uh, this is something that we need to keep a, a close eye on. As Charlie mentioned, lesser prairie chicken populations primarily occur on private lands. There are some prairie chickens that occur on public lands in the, on the U.S. Forest Service National uh, Comanche and Cimarron National Grasslands in Colorado and Kansas, respectively. As you can see here in this map, this, these uh, areas are, are located in the sand sagebrush prairie of southeastern Colorado, southwestern Kansas. Um, back in the 1980s, there was a large number of lesser prairie chickens on this area, but unfortunately, the populations have declined to the point now where we consider um, lesser prairie chickens to be essentially lo locally extirpated since uh, 2016 um, throughout much of, this, um, much of these public lands. The key to understanding lesser prairie chicken demography and occupancy is that they need a large variety of habitat types or habitat conditions for these populations to persist. They need different types of habitat for lecking or where they gather and display for mating purposes in the spring, for nesting, for raising their broods, and for wintering. And so for a population to persist, this vegetation structure and composition um, that is selected for at each life history stage must be available in this relatively large area where these birds um, occupy. Uh, they have relatively large home ranges. Uh, so in other words, we are looking for la essentially landscape heterogeneity uh, for these birds to persist. So there's a tremendous management dilemma associated with a bird that occupies such large areas and needs such different habitat types or patch types throughout their home ranges and their, and their population areas, is how do we create, restore, and enhance these landscapes to provide these habitat types needed by lesser prairie chickens on private working landscapes? So we have to work in conjunction with producers uh, in order to provide these uh, important habitats for lesser prairie chickens. So how do we provide the necessary landscape heterogeneity um, or the different habitat types at a scale large enough for a positive response by a lesser prairie chicken population. So scale is a huge issue when it comes to managing lesser prairie chickens. We need to manage at very, very large scales, spatial scales. And then finally, uh, and this is a subject of some of our future research, is how do we increase populations to objective levels and then facilitate colonization of either previously occupied habitat or enhanced restored habitat. So how do we get prairie chickens to move into areas that we are applying conservation strategies? How do we get them to move or, or, or colonize or disperse to um, areas in order to increase the occupied range or the occupied area as well as increase overall population abundance? So <clears throat> lesser prairie chickens occupy space or use landscapes based on a hierarchical decision process. 
where the initial decision is based on the amount of grassland on the landscape. You know, not all the grassland needs to be usable by lesser prairie chickens. For example, uh, they essentially do not use or do not persist unless in short grass prairie. But these, um, but the grassland um, of of these type uh, can need to be readily available uh, and contribute to the overall availability of grassland. And then so once they select an area based on the amount of grassland on the landscape, then they select individual patches or individual area, you know, areas or home ranges based on vegetation composition and structure. So how much grassland is needed? Way back in the 1970s, um, <clears throat> Crawford and Boland estimated or stated that lesser prairie chickens disappear from landscapes that have less than 63% prairie or grassland. There's been no evidence to cast out in this since that point in time. Dan Sullen's work uh, indicated that probability of use was maximized when you had 77% grassland on the landscape. However, this question is a lot more complicated because you have to take into account the interaction between land cover and climate, where abundance of lesser prairie chickens during years um, without extreme droughts is relatively there's you know as you as your amount of grassland over that 60, 60 to 65 percent um, is pretty much stable you know no matter how much cropland is available but during years with extreme droughts uh, abundance of, of lesser prairie chickens declines rapidly in areas that have greater amounts of cropland so they do need more grassland in order to survive these years of extreme drought. And as a matter of fact, Beth Ross's work um, there in, 19, in 2016 indicated that the ability to persist through an extreme drought was maximized at about 90% grassland. So as you increase the amount of cropland, you know, from 10 to 40%, then their ability to persist through drought um, declines and the populations can have a tendency to blink out under those conditions. Unfortunately, here's a map of the Palmer Drought Severity Index um, during just a few weeks ago. Uh, and you can see that throughout much of the current Lesser Prairie Chicken Occupied Range, uh, we're once again in a, in a severe intensive drought. Um, and these birds do not do well under these conditions. And so we would expect the population to decline again um, by next spring. In terms of the legal status, I'm just gonna go through this kind of quickly just to give a little context, but the lesser prairie chicken has been a subject of consideration for listing as a threatened or endangered species since uh, 1996. In 2014, it was listed as threatened throughout its range. That decision was vacated by a court ruling and the species was delisted from, um, under the Endangered Species Act in 2016. In May of 2021, uh, there's been a new proposal listing the northern uh, three ecoregions as threatened in Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, and part of Texas. And then the San Shinri Oak prairie ecoregion in New Mexico and part of Texas would be, is proposed to be listed as endangered. Uh, the final decision on, on this status has, has not been made. So lesser prairie chickens are greatly constrained uh, based off changes in the landscape. Um, and it probably will not be possible to achieve pre-European settlement conditions allowing for these uh, abundant populations that perhaps occurred in, you know, prior to settlement or at least in the late 1800s. Um, and so we need to concentrate on removing the risk of local extinction, which will require conservation of remaining large grassland areas, improving the habitat quality of these areas, and then using conservation approaches that are feasible uh, on privately owned land and accepted by landowners and producers. And so two of the, the primary management strategies include uh, livestock grazing and fire to create vegetation heterogeneity. Uh, 
most grazing practices or grazing strategies are designed to have a uniform grazing distribution using smaller pastures, increased stocking rates, and reduced grazing uh, periods. So in other words, you end up with a homogeneous uh, pasture or unit uh, relative to vegetation composition and structure. Um, patch burn grazing uh, developed uh, in Oklahoma and expanding out through much of the southern Great Plains uh, redistributes cattle on the grassland and creates heterogeneity in terms of uh, using grazing differences in grazing pressure based off of time since fire to create different uh, vegetation structure and composition on a relatively small area of the landscape. Unfortunately, prescribed fire is rarely used in the semi-arid or the western portion of the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range. And so then we are limited to use of grazing uh, throughout much of the, the western portion of the range. And so we uh, evaluated heterogeneity-based grazing management strategies uh, on Lesser Prairie Chicken Ecology. So in the western portion of the species range where uh, prescribed fire is, is not used or maybe not even an option, uh, landowners do not have much in terms of uh, practices that can be used to manage vegetation. And as a result, we, we um, evaluated different grazing uh, features uh, in terms of their effect on lesser prairie chicken. And so here are the ranges of our study sites or our study pastures where we radio tagged um, 116 female lesser prairie chickens uh, we, with GPS radio collars that allowed us a, a large number of locations of these birds under these kind of grazing conditions, including a range of 0 to 2.31 animal unit months per hectare, or so from a low density to a high density uh, stocking uh, rate, uh, a forage use from 0 to 77 percent of the forage, pasture area from very small to relatively large, and then under different uh, levels of grazing, a uh, growing season deferment, or periods when no grazing occurs, occurs. And so our goal was to determine how prairie chickens respond under these wide variety of grazing practices, as well as determine when we can maximize the amount of heter vegetation heterogeneity on the landscape. And so the, the most um, influential factor in terms of vegetation heterogeneity was stocking density. Whereas when, we, when you have stocking density in these semi-arid landscapes, less than 2.6 animal units per hectare, you maximize the amount of heterogeneity or variation in vegetation structure, which is really, really important when it comes to um, lesser prairie chicken use. And so one of the things that we were interested in is how non-breeding lesser prairie chickens respond to these grazing um, situations, because we can use um, nesting information for a good index relative to use by breeding birds, but non-breeding um, incorporates both males and females. And so the relative probability of use uh, by non-breeding lesser prairie chickens was greatest around 40% forage use, so a little bit less than the leave half, take half standard that we commonly use. As stocking distance density increased from low to high, probability of, of use decreases, and probability of use was lowest at about 40 to 60% deferment, or so if you you know, if you graze a little bit more than that or a little bit less than that, um, the birds seem to respond to it better. And then the, the most important factor is that uh, as you increase pasture area, uh, there is a linear increase in the probability of use. So and graphically, this is what it looks like. And so forage use in the upper left under that A uh, figure indicates that uh, probability of use or the likelihood that a prairie chicken will use that site mat is maximized, you know, right around 40% forage use during the non-breeding season. 
Uh, and that relationship changes slightly depending upon whether you're, you're in low density, medium density, or high density um, grazing pressure. Um, they're still, uh, you know, it still maximizes right around 35 to 40 percent forage use, but the probability of use declines dramatically as you go from low density um, grazing systems to high density grazing systems. Deferment, you can see that there, even though that there is a, is a relationship where deferment uh, caused the lowest set probability of use right around 40 to 60 percent deferment, uh, that relationship, you know, is, is not that strong, uh, especially when you compare it to pasture area where there is a very tight and a very strong linear relationship in terms of an increase of probability of use as you increase pasture area. So the relative probability of nest placement to, to index kind of uh, reproductive response to grazing pressure was affected uh, by grazing pressure and maximized at one to, you know, right around one animal unit uh, months per hectare. But there were no nests when grazing pressure was greater than 1.2. So there is a, a threshold here where, you know, once a certain grazing pressure is, is is reached, their lesser prairie chickens don't nest there. And so graphically, this is what it looks like. Uh, so probability of use by nesting lesser prairie chickens um, was basically maximized, again, right around one animal unit per month. And then once you get about, above 1.2, uh, birds don't nest there. They just, you know, prairie chickens have these very tight responses to some of these thresholds and this being one of them. So annual uh, adult survival um, was what we was sort of what we would expect and not influenced by grazing. Nest success was relatively high, but there was a, ne a negative relationship between grazing pressure and daily nest survival, which sort of looks like this, where if you get above about one AUM per hectare, nest survival starts to drop off dramatically in terms of uh, daily nest survival rate. So lesser prairie chickens respond positively to light to moderate grazing disturbances, uh, where greatest use was when forage use was less than 50% and stocking densities was less than 0.26 animal units per hectare. Uh, any pasture that had greater than 60% forage use did not support lesser prairie chickens. And increasing pasture size develops a gradient of grazing pressures within the pasture, which creates a gradient of vegetation structure and hence uh, a much greater probability of use. Nest site selection was most sensitive to grazing pressure um, and increased probability of use for nesting birds when forage use um, or decrease in probability of use when forage use um, increased beyond 20 percent because they need that thicker, taller vegetation during this period. Uh, effective deferment is kind of site specific, but it is possible to use grazing management to promote vegetation and patch heterogeneity uh, in these western semi-arid areas of the lesser prairie chicken range where we do not have um, fire. Yeah, but we did uh, examine or test the effect of patch burn grazing on lesser prairie chicken habitat in the eastern portion of their range. And we were trying to test or answer the question, how does prescribed fire affect nest selection, habitat, and space use? And Given that lesser prairie chickens have a, a, a tremendous response to encroaching trees, we also wanted to determine if prescribed fire can benefit lesser prairie chickens not only by providing changes in the vegetation structure, but also uh, controlling tree encroach, encroachment. And so we used a, a, a ranch down in the Red Hills of Kansas that had a wide variety of burning uh, regimes. Um, where there was basically patch burn grazing throughout much of the entire ranch, and found that 
nesting lesser prairie chickens only used areas that were greater than four years post fire. So the number of nests um, basically were dramatically larger in these, in these areas of this patch burn grazing dynamic. However, Lester Prairie chickens selected one and two year old or two year post fire pass, uh, patches during lecking, greater, like I mentioned, greater than four year post fire patches during nesting, and then year of fire and one year post fire patches during the post breeding and, and non breeding seasons. Um, and so essentially, all of the different patches were used by lesser prairie chickens at certain parts or certain points during their entire life cycle. Uh, and because uh, lesser prairie chickens selected all available time since fire patches during their life history, you know, patch burn grazing can be a viable management tool on these smaller areas to restore and maintain habitat on these landscapes in such a, in such a uh, composition on the landscape or such a design on the landscape that allows lesser prairie chickens to access all of these different habitat types without expending much energy in terms of movement. In addition, these prescribed fires in these patch bird burn uh, grazing mosaics can be used to prevent eastern red cedar encroachment uh, in the eastern part of the range. And so why is this important? Well, the loss of fire has allowed these trees to establish in these grasslands and the, as that photo or that image that Charlie showed early on, uh, the amount of, of increase of trees, especially in the eastern part of the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range, but also the eastern part of the, of the Great Plains, um, has dramatically increased over the last few decades. And in the eastern part of the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range, we're talking about eastern red cedars. And Lesser Prairie Chickens perceive structures, including trees on the landscape, as a potential predation risk and have a dramatic response to the presence of trees. And so we conducted some work, um, again, down in the Red Hills. And you can see here, um, the, on the right-hand side, uh, the blue dots are nest locations and the green dots are trees. And you can see that they basically don't mix. Um, and so lesser prairie chickens, um, and when they nest in the eastern part of their range, they avoid trees to the extent of about 300 meters from the nearest tree. However, this response is much more dramatic when you look at tree density. And so this is a figure of the proportion of lesser prairie chicken nests in relation to proportion of tree densities. Whereas you increase the density of trees on the landscape, in other words, number of individual trees per hectare, once you get above two trees per hectare, prairie chickens don't use it. It is a very dramatic threshold. Um, and so the proportion of nests, almost all of the nests are you know, less than point. 75 trees per hectare. Another graphically uh, way of putting this is this relative probability of use or resource selection curve, where once you reach two trees per hectare, uh, the probability of use um, is basically zero. They just don't, they, they abandon that entire area once you get above a couple trees per hectare. And the, when I talk about trees, we're talking about anything that's basically three and a half to four feet tall or, great, or taller. Um, and then the uh, relative probability of use by lesser prairie chickens in it that, that doesn't include, that where the locations don't include nests, you'll see that they have a very strong response uh, out to about 600 to 800 meters from the nearest tree uh, in terms of where they will go um, during the rest of their life cycle throughout the rest of the year. So anything, you know, you're looking at anything 400 meters or above uh, as a potential um, area usable by lesser prairie chickens from trees, anything less than 400 meters or so, um, you have a probability of loose use of less than 50% and um, essentially birds are avoiding these areas. And so 
one of the major components of the landscape in west in the western part of the Lester Prairie Chicken Range is, is conservation reserve program grasslands, and um, there. Uh, Conservation reserve grasslands in the Blessed Prairie Chicken Range uh, basically peaked out at greater than 700,000 hectares um, and provide a, a structural component that is no longer available in some of these areas or as a structural component that never existed before, especially up there in the shortgrass prairie CRP mosaic. But the value of CRP varies throughout the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range Following a precipitation gradient, uh, and this is one of the most surprising things that, that we found. Um, first off, lesser prairie chickens have adapted to CRP throughout their range, and persistence of many populations, especially in some of these um, high density prairie chicken areas, is dependent upon CRP. Uh, even when we released birds into a novel landscape, they selected for CRP. So this is just a, a little short uh, example of birds that were released or translocated lesser prairie chickens from the shortgrass prairie mosaic down into the San Sagebrush ecoregion. And this is the selection ratio where anything above one indicates that that area or those landscapes are selected by those birds. And you can see that the selection ratios for CRP, both during the breeding season and non-breeding season, were much larger than any other um, major landscape feature uh, in this in the in this area, and so even when the birds are released, they're still um, selecting for uh, CRP um, in these landscapes, despite the fact that CRP only uh, only occurs in a very small proportion of these landscapes. So as you move from uh, <clears throat> east to west in the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range. Um, you go from the mixed grass prairie to the short grass prairie. And so you start losing these taller, thicker grasses the farther west you go. And there's also a precipitation gradient as you go from west or east to west as well, from relatively high amounts of precipitation down to, you know, basically semi-arid landscapes that have limited amounts of uh, precipitation. <coughs> Here is a map of the existing CRP uh, as of 2014 uh, throughout you know, western Kansas, eastern Colorado, uh, and occurring in the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range. And the probability of use of CRP changes dramatically as you go from west to east, where you have a very high probability of, of use in the western part of the range and a relatively low probability of use in the eastern part of the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range. So Lesser Prairie Chicken selected landscapes that had greater than 65% grass, according to Boland and, and Crawford, but they are most likely to use CRP grasslands when these local landscapes have about, um, you know, were about 5,000 acres of grassland, or were about 5,000 acres of, of landscape where 70% was native prairie. So as you increase the amount of native grassland in, a, in an occupied area by lesser prairie chickens, they're much more likely to use CRP. And this translates into a fitness benefit whereby lesser prairie chickens that uh, use CRP have a considerable higher uh, lambda value or contribution to um, the overall population as, re, as, as opposed to lesser prairie chickens and native working grasslands. And so when you put CRP on the landscape, lesser prairie chickens primarily use CRP for nesting as the nest density uh, in CRP is twice as high in native prairie or in CRP as native prairie. So even though lesser prairie chickens occupy a small area, a relatively small area in many of these landscapes, they provide an important nesting component uh, that is used by uh, lesser prairie chickens. So lesser, uh, lesser prairie chickens were seven times more likely to use CRP when the average annual 
uh, precipitation of 55 centimeters compared to 70. So you increase habitat availability um, primarily for nesting as survival is not really affected or changed by the presence of CRP. And so we look at CRP as a, a habitat that provides refugia during periods of intense drought. So it allows these birds to have a, uh, an area that is somewhat reliable for nesting during these intense periods of drought. So how do we take this information and move it into a, um, a conservation strategy? And uh, Dan Sullins did this work um, whereby he examined uh, this idea of tree removal and CRP placement uh, as a potential um, conservation strategy for lesser prairie chickens. And so using these features in terms of relative probability of use, you can see that uh, as the proportion of grassland increases, probability of use by lesser prairie chickens increases dramatically. So you see that peak of about 0.77 or 77% grassland is where these um, probability of use uh, is maximized. But then these, uh, you, taking into account these other features of the landscape, including roads, vertical features, oil wells, and transmission lines, where you see a, a really rapid response to the presence of these features on the landscape, you can determine how much land is, is, is available for lesser prairie chickens. And so in Kansas and Colorado, when you stack all of these different features on the landscape, you can see that these prairie chicken populations are subjected to or stressed by a large number of uh, features in the landscape, which eliminates much of these areas as, as available habitat. Um, and as a result, uh, we conducted in, in a species distribution model and to show where in these areas you have a high probability of occurrence based off of landscape features, including these structures and the amount of grassland. And you can see here that these areas, you know, um, the amount of available habitat is greatly reduced when you consider these conditions. And so it appears that lesser prairie chickens are constrained to areas that have greater than 70% grassland and less than 10 vertical features in 12.6 square kilometers. So when you take all that information and apply it to the ecoregions, currently uh, uh, we estimate available currently available um, habitat in the mix, mixed grass prairie is about 16% of what is defined in the short in the sand sagebrush prairie about 9% of that area is available habitat and about 8% is available in the short grass prairie so we can develop a strategy um, for strategic conservation including things like tree removal where we, where we have an overlap of prairie chicken habitat and tree densities, uh, creating an area of high priority, priority for tree removal, along with uh, strategic location of CRP, um, most likely where there is greater than 60% native prairie in areas where there is less than 55 centimeters of, of rainfall. And so when you, when you strategically apply these two conditions, you can get a situation like this, where in the upper slide, you, you see strategic locations for tree removal in those orange and red areas. And by removing trees in these areas, you can restore 100,000 acres of habitat. Uh, in the western part of the range, let, you know, to the west of the 55 centimeter um, belt of annual precipitation, you can restore 60,000 acres of habitat using strategic CRP enrollment. And so conserving large uh, prairie landscapes is, is necessary for the persistence of lesser prairie chickens because these larger areas are more resilient to drought. Um, we need habitat in both ecoregions to resist these negative events from weather and um, drought. 
Um, we, by restoring trees and CRP, as, as indicated, we can probably increase populations by more than 10%. Um, much of this work is available um, through these two publications uh, <laughs> that are down in the link box um, that were part of the NRCS Lesser Prairie Chicken Initiative and uh, available. Uh, and also, uh, we, we do have, you do have the availability to get those publications through those scientific journals as well. Uh, in the future, we're going to work um, primarily with movement models to evaluate how prairie chickens move within and among areas, and then determine thresholds for the persistence of lesser prairie chicken. Um, we want to determine additional thresholds, both in terms of landscapes and population values that will allow for the persistence of lesser prairie chickens uh, in order to inform corridors, colonization, dispersal, things of that nature that continue to fine tune our strategies related to lesser prairie chickens. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to this presentation and I'd like to thank everybody that supported our research project. Well, thanks Dave, that's a, it's a lot of information. I know we just about ran out of time here, but there's, there's a lot there and I, I hope folks get an understanding of sort of some of the information that you provided can really help us define kind of where those core areas are to, you know, avoid some of the anthropogenic stressors uh, to, to really focus through the, the Great Plains uh, framework uh, strategy. Um, there weren't any questions that came in during the presentation, but um, with just a, the minute or two we have left, um, you were talking about the patch burn grazing uh, mosaics. Um, did you find, I mean like the patch burn grazing is basically done to sort of lead the cattle around to various places. Did you find the stocking density um, or grazing pressure had any effect on chicken use like it did in some of the other areas? Like there's a sweet spot of, of grazing pressure? Or does that not matter? Uh, well, yes. Um, it's a, you know, we, we did that. Um, we conducted that work. Uh, we haven't actually published it yet. The really interesting thing is, is we compared patch burn grazing uh, interactions between cattle and lesser prairie chickens to cattle and lesser prairie chickens in a rotational system. And in a rotational system, there's significant overlap between locations of cows and prairie chickens. In the patch burn grazing system, there's hardly any overlap. So they're using totally different patches. Uh, in those patch burn systems. And, and so in that regard, uh, stocking density is probably not as important in those systems as it is farther west. Okay, interesting. Uh, there was a question came in about using drones to keep chickens away from wind turbines, and I'm not sure that's really an issue because they avoid wind turbines anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, they, they do avoid wind turbines, and fortunately there's not a major development of wind turbines uh, associated with lessers at this point in time uh, compared to, you know, some of the greater greater prairie chicken areas. Um, I, you know, lessers have a much less tolerance for structures than greater prairie chickens. Um, and so as soon as that first wind turbine goes up, they tend to avoid them um, or, or switch their areas and they don't even really even go close to them. Uh, in, in any in any regard. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions, and it looks like we're about at the top of the hour. So uh, I want to thank uh, Dave you for your time here today. There's a lot there. I encourage folks to to download the Great Plains Grassland Biome that's in the the web uh, today's web uh, links, um, as well as to you know review your slides later. So I'm going to turn it back over to Creech to sort of wrap it up here for us this afternoon. So thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Charlie. We do have a few reminders before we go. So before those, though, I want to start with a big thank you to Dan, to Charlie, to Dr. Hocus, and to all of you who've joined us for today's discussion on the conservation of this important bird.
We will post the recording of today's webinar along with the slides and transcripts on our NRCS Conservation Outcomes webpage. The link for that page is included under today's links. We also have recordings of past webinars on that page and details on how to sign up for the Gov Delivery emails we mentioned at the beginning of the session. And with that, we hope to see you again for future webinars. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us.